Who've heard of the word DevSecOps? Who likes the word DevSecOps? That's pretty much three people. I love that. I appreciate that, that you like it. Uh, the first time I saw this word, DevSecOps, I was like, oh, wow, really? Yet another buzzword? Let's put it in between machine learning and blockchain, and we've got the full buzzword bingo card, and we can play along. But honestly, if you look at that word, it starts with DevOps. Who practices DevOps? Okay, who tries to practice DevOps in some sort of way? But, meh. Okay, but DevOps, we try to, like, DevOps pretty much says, like, before DevOps, we had a, uh, an application, you threw it over the wall, it was like, now it's your problem, right? I created it, and the ops people were, like, works on my machine, now it's up to you. Um, with DevOps, we try to tear down that wall between developers and operations, and think about it, if as a team, to some extent, you're responsible for getting it into production via CICD, and when things go wrong, they call your team to either get up in three in the morning or first thing in the morning to fix it and redeploy it, then, ladies and gentlemen, you practice DevOps. You own what you create. There's no wall in between. However, security is still not in there. I mean, if something goes wrong, it's like, I don't care. I'm a developer. I just create things, right? We've got the security team to fix that. But is that the right approach? Think about it. Think, think about your own Scrum or Kanban board. All these things, all these assignments that are on that board are feature-driven. As a program manager, I want, if I click on X, it needs to do Y. And nowadays, like 10 years ago, we didn't think about cloud, but nowadays we implicitly think about scalability and maintainability because it's somewhere at AWS cloud, and if that thing uses too much firepower, <laughs> it costs us big money. In that same set, we need to, we, we need to be scalable, and that kind of set, we same set, we need to think about security as well. And that's what my talk is about today. This is me, by the way. Not very important, but uh, they say I'm a Java champion. I still don't know why. Do some things in the community. Again, not important, but I work for a security company, and I am a Java developer. So that's the reason why I'm standing here. But let's get into what we're actually trying to solve and not talk about me. So there is pretty much a, whoa, we're going way too fast. I know we want lunch, but not too fast. We are like, what kind of problem do we try to solve with that DevSecOps thingy? Well, let me take you into my own story from, say, about 12 to 15 years ago when I started as a junior developer, and I worked at one of the government agencies within the Netherlands. I'm based in, in, in the Netherlands, and uh, at that point, we deployed our software three times a year, which was marvelous. I mean, I could create a bunch of stuff, and then at a certain point in time, we created a release candidate, and then the ops team is going to test it for me. And then they might go into production. They had time to pen test everything. You know, that felt good. Works on my machine, now it's your problem. However, before I joined Sneak, I worked at a, say one of the major uh, e-commerce platforms in the Netherlands, pretty much the same as Amazon. Uh, but at that point, we released three times a day instead of three times a year. Try pen testing that. That's pretty much impossible. So we try to speed up these things, to be del these deliveries, for the reason of if I can get this out earlier than my competitor, I have an advantage, right? And that makes sense because in the end, we all try, try to make money. However, because we speed up these things, security is not really on our mind. Because again, that program manager is breathing down my neck, get that feature out. Today, that's impossible. Tomorrow, okay. Of course I can't do that because I'm a senior engineer. I definitely can do that, but I might, take to, I might cut corners. And we all know that in the end, this leads to a problem because the siloed expertise of security is most of the time at the end. I release three times a day. Don't think that my security team is able to review my stuff three times a day, not even three times a week. Maybe one time a month. And we need to play along with each other because if I'm just cowboying around and just making things happen, but don't think about security, and the security team is, first of all, they're, they're hating me pretty much, but in the end, we're all on the same team and we need to make sure that customer data is not compromised. We don't wanna be that 
big next headline in the newspaper. Unless you feel that's good marketing. So how bad is that situation? Let's go into, if we think about security, the first thing we think about is the code that is available on our Git repository. Who's using Git? Thank you, I don't have to educate you on, on SVN or even, even worse, so Git. Let, let's just keep it to that, on your Git repository. Um, who of you does code reviews? So the other 10% does pair programming. I appreciate that. <laughs> so let's do something. I, I created my first Spring Boot application because why not, right? Spring can do everything. Um, and I created my first endpoint. This is my first endpoint. What is wrong with it from a security perspective? Don't say the collar is off or the braces should be on the same line or the other line. I don't care. What's wrong with it? So we might do security reviews, but we don't see the security problem. Or we might do code reviews, but we might not see the security problem because this is the problem. As part of the request, I have a request parameter, which is a name, a string user. That name, I put it into the response writer without doing any validation nor sanitization. This is what we call a classic cross-site scripting, reflective cross-site scripting issue. Pretty much if I do something like this, this script, an alert, which the alert is harmless, but will execute. That means I can execute JavaScript. And we all like yeah, JavaScript, right? No. Some people say I know out loud, a lot of people like, <laughs> no. This, which is fine, no worries. But we can execute it. This means I can execute an alert, which is not, uh, not interesting, but I might be able to go into your session ID, your cookies, grab something out, put it in another web server, uh, gather all that information, and if I have enough information, I might be able to do something on your behalf because I have your session ID or something like that. I can execute code, and that's harmful because I didn't sanitize it. And you can do a lot of these things, like with script, with mouse overs, with image sources, but think about it. We're doing code reviews, but how do you think, how do you think about code reviews? Are you actually taking care of that, or is it, hey, I worked on this for three weeks, now demo time, so hey, Junior on my team. We got 20 minutes. Let's review it so we can tick the box that at least two people saw it so we, I can commit it to production. That junior is there like a bunch of code, three weeks of work, looks fine to me. And it gets it to production. Yeah. Or it will be like, yeah, that curly brace is on the wrong line because you know that that's not a good review. So think about who you, who you ask to review that stuff. Is that your average engineer, is that your junior engineer, or is that if it's security heavy in some cases, you put that to the person who is savvy with security. Probably the last one, if you have that person on your team. But think about that. It's not just an arbitrary person. So say we, we, we have this, and I have an application over here, and I will, I will enlarge it, no worries. Um, let's get into some of my Spring Boot controllers. And what I did, I scanned my code for some vulnerabilities because, hey, I can let the security reviewer or team catch it, but why not catch it right away while I'm coding? And of course, my, my, my scanner already says, like, hey, there is a cross-site scripting issue. And it starts somewhere here at line 35 and goes to line 38. Cool, let's see what it, uh, what it does. Well, it's pretty much the issue I just described to you. So I have the parameter over here and I write it out with, without doing any, any sanitization. It can also say I have some, some SQL injection issues, uh, and we probably know that. I mean, if you look at this, it says that something, it starts at the find by user, and it goes all the way to line 30 in the search repository. So let's go to the search repository, and then you see over here that I'm doing a, having a problem with, oh, over here if I'm concatenating as a string the parameter to the SQL string. And of course, we should do that with a parameterized query. Or um, making sure at least that, that we don't concatenate it, but we do it in two steps. The other thing is, and this, these, these are equal. These, these are very, very, probably very easy if we look at a code review and take some time for that. But what do you think about this one? A path reversal. OK. It has a path reversal, and we'll, I will show this one down. A path reversal in this code. It is an upload thing. 
Like I have an upload file, a multi-part file, and I save it over here. The problem is that a multi-part file is just a POJO, a code representation of a probably a, a HTTPS request, uh, a post request towards your system. Um, one of these fields is the get original file name. But what if I am able to change that metadata of the file name into something like this? Say my file name is something like dot dot slash, dot dot slash, dot dot slash, dot dot slash, going all the way back to the root of my system, depending of course on what privilege I have, going to a folder, going to a file, and might be able to override it for a certain file on your system that you didn't expect, which changes the, either the behavior of your system or puts in a script that I can challenge later to execute it. That's nice. The thing what you have to do is not just use it, but for instance, look at the canonical path. So one of the things, what, uh, what does it say here? Hmm. Yeah, one of the suggestions is Look at the canonical path. So actually, where does it execute to? To see if that actually starts with the upload folder I, I, I want it to be. And if that is true, then I can safely safely write it to there. So these kind of things um, you can easily already catch if you are on your local system and using the right tooling. So OK, you caught that. You're fine. You have the good reviewer. And then, you're, then, then we're done, right? I'm sorry, we're not, because code was just the first part of your journey. That was, it is what's on top, that's what's visible. Underneath the surface line, there are other troubles. Like the first things are your open source dependencies. Who is using Java without using any libraries? Exactly. The first thing we do is, is like Spring Boot Starter or Corkers whatever, or, and then do you know what actually does that bring in? How many libraries did you put into your, your application? I don't, because a Spring Boot Starter is just an empty jar file with a POM in it that brings tens or twenties of other libraries in. And because libraries use libraries use libraries, I have no clue what I'm actually using. Seriously, I have no clue. And everything is on the class path, if we're talking about the old-fashioned class path. And technically, it can be loaded in memory. So saying like, yeah, but not everything is reachable. No, not yet. But we can reach it if I can elevate it into memory. That's a challenge. So who heard of a company called Equifax? Yeah, 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 keep your hands up. Who heard of that company, say, before 2017? That's one person. I would say that's good marketing. Everybody knows your name. And you know why they know, they know the name? Because of these, these articles. And I'm not going into the company because I, I believe they were a victim. But what they did is they built their application on top of an outdated framework. At that point, Apache Struts 2. And that specific version, it's 2017, eh? so I get it. Apache Struts, why? Yeah, I got it. 2017, still. We had a whole pandemic after that. And anyway, what I was sort of trying to say, like at that point, they, at that point the, when they went to production, they're probably A-OK. -okay. Nothing's wrong. But because it wasn't production and everybody is focusing on new features, Nobody saw what was there in production, but was focusing on that new feature because my program manager is putting that on my scrum board. So the version that was in was vulnerable. And there was a vulnerability found on March of that year, March 2017, was fixed. The breach was in May, so that's already a few months later. And it took over 75 days, 76 to be in total, to actually find that they found out like, oh, somebody's in. Oh my God, what happened? At that point, they snooped around uh, over 140 million U.S. customers uh, were compromised, and it cost them about 2.1, 2.0, 2.1 billion dollars up to now. And I'm not looking into the brand Equifax because it's a very important company, crediting company, United States, very important to them. However, um, let's go into the hack, and you actually will see what happens. I'm um, going to an application, and uh, this application. Actually, hopefully, yeah, it runs. And it runs, as you can see, it runs on Heroku. So big, bad internet. Hopefully, the Wi-Fi works so it can actually demo this. Um, this is the problem. I can do a curl request with a specific content type. Who recognizes this content type? Come on. Nobody? You recognize it? 
Uh, no worries. It's, it, it's an invalid content type. It's a non-existing content type. There you go. Anyway, what happens is because it's invalid, I mean, it's just a key value pair, content type and the value. Because it's an invalid content type, you go down an exceptional flow in this specific version of Apache Struts 2. And in that exceptional flow, for some reason, God knows why, you could use OGNL, the Object Graph Navigational Language, which is an expression language in Apache Struts. And with that expression language, I can call certain functions on certain objects, or I can create new objects. And that's what I'm doing here. Like, who is a Java developer here? Cool, then you probably know what a process builder is. So I'm creating a new process builder. I'm feeding the process builder, or I'm spinning up the bash, so a shell, and I'm giving that shell an arbitrary command. And what I do is I route the output writer to an input writer so I can actually show what's happening here. So let me just do that. And let's go for the environment variables for a second. So what I'm doing here, I'm using that header I just showed you. And um, I do, just do a switch. The word command goes out, the word env goes in. And for those who don't know, the env command on a Linux machine just shows you the environment variables. Nothing special. And that's not going to localhost. No, no, no. Let's go to Heroku. So if I do this, and I'm using that header and do that, do that substitution, I might be able to get the environment variables da, 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 over here. So I know what the environment variables are, are on that specific pod on the internet. OK, the environment variables, uh, variables are maybe not that interesting. But if I am able to read this kind of stuff, I might be able to read other stuff. And if I have privilege that I can write to certain pages or certain, to certain places, I can create a file. Create a file with some content. Create a nice little script. Come back tomorrow and execute that script. Good luck with your DevOps and finding out in your postmortem what happened. It's pretty impossible. This is an arbitrary code execution, as we call this, because of this weird thing. And this was already found and fixed, but we didn't upgrade yet. So keeping track on that is important. And of course, it's, it's interesting to see the Java home. Uh, maybe we can do something with that later. Depends on time. Anyway, so say this is your application. How much of your application is your code? This is the binder. This is your jar or your war, or maybe for, very, for, 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 for folks that work with very old stuff like WebSphere, this is your ear file. How much of that is your code that you actually wrote? This. And we take good pride of that because half of you, or Lyle well, well, says, 60% did code reviews and the rest did pair programming. We take good pride of that. It's good code. We're, we're proud of it. But how about the rest? How do you look at the rest of your code, of, that, of all the dependencies, all the libraries that you bring in? Because you're not just responsible for that little purple dot. You're responsible for the whole shebang. Do you have policies? Like when, do you, when does a, a new um, library can come in? Um, when does it go out? Do I actually scan it for vulnerabilities? Do I update it often? Interesting, right? So I have a Spring Serverless example. Horrible code, 222 lines are very duplicative code because it was a demo. So I copy pasted a lot of crap. It was horrible. So I just, I'm, I, I won't dare to show it all, just snip it because it kind of looks okay. Still want to have that Java title, Java champion title. Anyway, I have five dependencies and Five direct dependencies, we know it's Maven in this case. How many dependencies do I bring into my system? Just guess. A hundred. Half of them. 45. But more importantly, 45 dependencies, 222 lines of code. How many lines of code is my team responsible for? It's not 222, trust me. It's not even, one, uh, it's not even a thousand lines more. How many lines of code do you think my team is responsible for? Because we implicitly inherit some stuff. Call a number. It's the number. <laughs> Just a little bit shy of half a million lines of code. And of most of them, I have no clue what's going into them because I'm actually not reading all the source files of what Spring is bringing in. You got me? So we need to have something to clear that. Because 
in the end, open source usage has exploded, of course. We see more libraries coming up with the, that things are not always in the Java, frame, uh, yeah, Java core language. We bring in libraries that does things for us for a good reason. I don't want to create yet another boilerplate CRUD repository or something like that. No, I've got my Spring libraries to do that for me for a good reason. So usage of open source libraries has exploded. I love that. But also, the bad people are also looking at that. I can't do that right now. Oh, that's good. <laughs> but attackers are looking at that at the same time. So that means that if you don't update and a problem is found and disclosed, you're at risk. Because if it is a library that is well used by the population uh, and something goes wrong over there, I have a substantial amount of victims. And where did we heard that before? Well, every year new packages come into the ecosystem, and as we can see, NPM is the clear winner. And I can make a lot of jokes about the quality of it, but I won't. Anyway, if we look at the amount of vulnerabilities found or identified, and responsibly, hopefully responsibly disclosed by ecosystem, there are a bunch of them in the, in the Maven, in Maven Central, and I we took that as a benchmark. Bottom line is that what we pull in in either our POM or our Gradle file, or manifest file, or if you're doing NPM on your package.json, that's not what we actually get in. I mean, traversably, we have dependencies coming in four, five, six layers deep, and most of the problems are in these layers. So where were you, say, December 10th, 2021? Last December, it was a Friday. Where were you? <laughs> Patching, updating microservice. You, that, those people know because I was actually on that point of going on vacation. <laughs> Guess what? That didn't really happen. Um, who, who did not heard of Log4J? Who, who was involved in patching something, something Log4J? Who did not patch their Log4J yet? Please get out. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, there, might, there might be reasons for that. But uh, the point was, we all know what Log4J did. There. Or that was, it was a package used by a lot of folks. And because if, we, well, we could log something and we could, we could insert a certain string, it ended up in some, some um, remote code execution again. Um, what we saw within Sneak, and we scan a lot of customers, well, we have a bunch of customers, but we saw that 60%, almost 60% had that library as a transitive dependency pretty much don't know, they were just using a logger, had no clue which logger they were using, which implementation, which version. And at that point, at December 10th, every version of Log4j was vulnerable. Every version prior to 2.15. At the f in the first 72 hours, over 800,000 attacks were registered, as in people found out. They, most of them were automated. Doesn't mean they worked, but you see that there is no zero day anymore. Like if it's, it's a zero minute nowadays. If something goes wrong, people will create scripts and just crawl with bots over the internet and try every single endpoint to see if it works. And we found out on Maven Central that over 17,000 packages were vulnerable because they had log4j as a transitive dependency. in them. So for those who are not aware how that log4j issue worked, I was briefly explained it in a TLDR version of this. This is the nicest drawing my little cousin made. No, it's not true. It's one of my colleagues that made it, but I still need to redo this because I think it's interesting. Anyway, we've got an application over here. And say I log something because, for instance, an error log, because most of the time error logs are on. And a good use case for that is if I log in with a username and password and that's wrong. You probably log in failed attempt by username X. Right? So, if I know that, I can use that to do, to insert an arbitrary string. And you see that arbitrary string with that dollar sign, and what I do here, I do a JNDI request. For some reason, it was allowed to do a JNDI request together with the LDAP protocol. Don't ask me why, but this was in Log4j since 2013. If I own the LDAP server, I can give back a reference, for instance, and that reference is to a pre-compiled class that I serve to you on an HTTP machine or on, on a web server that I also own, and that, fi that file comes into your system. If that file is shaped the right way, by instantiating that, I can 
arbitrary execute things. Because if my file looks like this, if it implements the object factory, and implicitly you have to overwrite the get object instance as well, I can do something like this. And basically what I do here is I'm opening the calculator on my screen. Not very useful, but just to show you that it actually works. Where do I have it? Oh, it's over here. Let's log out of this one so I actually have to log in. And this is where the Spring, oh, this is where the Spring Boot application runs, and this is my LDAP server and my HTTP server that run. So I just do it on my local machine just to show you that it actually is true. So if I do something like this, I give it a wrong uh, username, what I will see in my logs is, yes, failed attempt log in by username blah blah blah. Cool, now I can use this. So I log, instead of doing a logging, I, uh, doing, a, doing a username, I actually do an LDAP request, in this case to my own system on port 9999 slash evil, that gives me back that exact class that I showed you. So because my LDAP server is running, I just have to put in a bogus password. And what we see now is that the calculator starts up. Woohoo! Super, super interesting if you want to calculate things. However, I'm not into calculating things. So let's change a few things, just for the sake. I've got 23 minutes. I should be working on that. Hopefully, this is totally improvised, by the way. Let me see. Over here, I've got my server, and this is the class I'm giving you. So what you see over here is that I opened the calculator. But let's not do that, and let's execute this string. This is what we call, we execute, we execute something in the bash and basically try to set up a reversed shell attack. So basically what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to execute code on the victim that opens up a port and actively go searching for a, for, for, for a shell connection on the other side. Luckily, I am the other side and I just have to listen to that port. So let's do this. Going back. To my server, I have to recompile, of course. Last time I did it, I totally forgot that, and it didn't work. So Maven package skip test. Pray to the Wi-Fi gods. Hopefully this works. Yes, cool. Maven execute Java. And hopefully my LDAP server and my HTTP server are running again. So still my application is still online, and now I only, as the attacker, I have to, I have one tool that I'm using, that is Natcat, and I'm listening with Natcat to port 9001. Just listening to that and watch, watch, uh, watching for incoming connections. Over here, now I change the payload of that class. I pretty much do the same thing. And boom, I have a reverse connection to my own server, of course, but still, I have a reverse connection. I open from the victim, I open the connection back to the attacker. And now I can just do like, whatever is, oh, don't do it in caps. Whatever I can do here, I have an open terminal available. I can, who, who am I? Of course, I am me as a user. But can you imagine if it, this works on a, on a remote machine? If you're able to do a remote code execution, and I am here, I know my own IP, I just put the payload in such a way that it connects to me. And hopefully you run it in a Docker container, because who knows what the default user for a Docker container is? Root. Good. And now I have root access in a terminal, and hopefully you were such an idiot to put the full Java code, including the JDK, including the compiler in your Docker container. Just change the code, recompile it, and execute it again without putting the container down. And now I have a Bitcoin miner or whatever I want. You get me? So these arbitrary code execution, opening a calculator, sounds fun, but this is more interesting. I can actually attack you. And of course, I get the user that the application is runs with, with that privileges. So if it doesn't work with elevated privileges, we have to do something more. But in many cases, it was, hey, works on my machine, ship it. So we have two, full, we have two mistakes at once. All right. Um, just for the sake of argument, let's close this because or else my security team will like, hey, who's doing a reverse shell attack on your machine? It's like, that's me. 
Yes, I have that. That, that, that happened. That was no, no, no joke. Uh, let's skip this one. Open source maintainers, we asked them in our state of open source security, how confident are you at your own security knowledge? 63% says, well, kind of. So we implicitly trust, hmm, kind of. But we do demand that we do code reviews and pair programming. That is a bit counterproductive. Also, how do you find out about vulnerabilities, we asked people. And 27% said, I probably won't. YOLO. Most important question is this one. Who should be responsible for security? And that is a multitude of answers because it can be developers, it can be security, it can be operations, but it should be all three of them, as you can see. And developers need to take their fair share because we solve the problems. We want to create that code. We want to have that autonomy as a team that I can solve that, that problem in the way I want, not how my manager says to do it because my manager knows Jack, whatever, doesn't know anything about coding. And he just says, make it work. So I am responsible for making it work, pulling in dependencies, creating code. But that code and these dependencies should be good. Not only fast, not only scalable, not only maintainable and up to date, but also safe. That hands for your code, that hands for your dependencies. But also we're talking about infrastructure over here. So let me get you to that second piler under the water. Containers. Who's using, who's using Docker? OK, that's a bunch of them. 2019, I did a small research on Docker containers and downloaded the 10 most commonly used Docker containers from Docker Hub. Because what is the first line of a Docker file? From Ubuntu, from Maven OpenJDK 3, from whatever. You probably base your image, most likely, on somebody else's image. So I downloaded the 10 most commonly used base images and scanned them for vulnerabilities. Ta-da, NPM is the winner. Winner. Thing is, it wasn't the problem of Node.js. It was the problem of the Node.js latest version is depending on a full-blown Debian uh, operating system. And then you can think of, do I need a full-blown Debian operating system if I'm building that tiny microservice? Probably not, because that operating system brings in binaries. And even though there might not be a direct hit to a binary that has a vulnerability, most of the security problems are not a direct hit. Because I can do this, I can connect it to something else, connect it to something else, connect it to something else that is vulnerable, and boom. So we cannot predict if this is a possibility in one of the chains. So we need to take care of this because it's, again, it's some sort of dependency. When do you scan your Docker images for open source, or for operating system vulnerabilities? And 50% of our respondents says we don't. Okay. And how do you find out about new vulnerabilities when you actually deploy the containers? I probably won't. These are answers, actually, that people gave. And the interesting thing is that, think about it, if you just rebuild a container without touching your code and still works, that might already save you from a lot of potential vulnerabilities. And even though you might think, how bad is that? That only works if you're absolutely sure and you want to take the risk. I would ask you and I would urge you to, uh, to, to talk to somebody from Equifax if they think the same nowadays. So. Let's hack this crap. So I have, an I have the same application I showed you before. Over here, this is on Heroku, but I've got uh, another one, and that is, as you can see, it runs on my local host. And it runs in a container. So let me pick up that thing. This is the, it's actually running, but let me show you the container, or the Docker file. So, Docker file. This is the Docker file. So I did a multi-stage build. I used Maven 3 JDK 8 because it's a JDK 8 build. And I built the stuff, and then I made a second tier uh, uh, container, so a second step. And I used a Tomcat 8.5.1 because it's an old version with Apache struts, needs to run on Tomcat. So this is a pretty good, good example of a multi-stage build. You should do that because now I don't own the, have the code in my final container. I only have the artifact. Cool. There are already a few problems with this, but I come back to come to uh, back to that later. One of the problems is that if I go to look into that Tomcat 8.5.2, there is a tiny vulnerability in there. It was possible to upload a JSP file to the server via a specially crafted request, just by using the container. 
This JSP could then be, uh, be, 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 could then be requested, and code it contained could be executed. That sounds like fun, so I don't have to touch your application. I just attacked your container. My favorite database of all, the exploit database, because this was already known in 2017. But just to show you, um, this is a Python script that, does, that creates that specially crafted request. And it does it in two stages. The first stage, it creates a JSP with a println with all A's, just to show if it actually executes and prints all A's. The second step is more interesting. Then we actually introduce a JSP file containing a form. That form contains a text box and a submit button. And every time I submit the button or press on the button, I submit this. And actually, what I put in, I will call the runtime and actually execute that command. So I build myself a web shell. Let's try this. And just that I, it's, this one is not existing yet. And this one doesn't exist as well. So let's go to the POC, which means if all the A's are there. So I loaded this Python script over here. And now I just have to call it. Come on. Don't leave me hanging this time. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, this is whatever happens to the demo gods, right? Normally, it should come back and say something. I can do it one more time. I don't ever say this to people outside. But let's check if I can redo this. Source it. And now it downloads to try to download Python 3. Hmm. Use Docker scan again. Yeah, OK. Check. Maybe it works. Oh, man. Why? Well, let's skip this one in this case. Let's try the other one. If, the, if this one doesn't work, maybe the other one does work. PWN. Of loading web shell, but I think there is something wrong with my connection. Yeah, there's something wrong. OK, the point is, if you actually execute it, a web shell will come up. It will actually be shown. And everything I put in that text box and I submit I get it as an output right away. So I built myself a web shell by attacking the container instead of attacking the application, which means that whatever application you have there, that's not the problem. We should think about the container as well. And I'm so sorry this, this, this didn't work, but yeah, this is probably something to do with downloading and the Wi-Fi. Anyhow, let's continue, because I have far more to say. We've got 11 minutes left. So we talked about code, we talked about open source, and we talked about containers. But then the last part under the service is your infrastructure as code. You for what? Your Kubernetes, or Kubernetes, or like that thing with an 8 in it that people write it down. I don't know why. Anyway, say you're, you're orchestrating your mesh or your, your, your landscape with Kubernetes, or you're using something like uh, Terraform. I mean, basically, all your infrastructure nowadays is part of your code base. And there can be a lot of mistakes in there, like giving a certain pod elevated privileges that it's outward facing for some reason. That can be an interest to somebody to combine a few things in your container and in your application to finally blow it up or something like that. So we should take care of that as well. I promised you one more hack for the open source thing. And hopefully, because the other thing didn't, didn't work, maybe this one works. So this Java goof on Heroku is still open. That is great. Uh, where is my terminal? My terminal is here. Now let's go back to this one. Because we know from that Apache struts hack, we know the environment variables. And we know that we have the, the Java home. Cool. So if I log into this application and I actually sign up, um, let's do my name, and let's do my email address, and a password, one, two, three, four, five, six, because I work at a security company. This is taped, right? Oh, damn. <laughs> Don't tell my manager. Anyway, what I can do, I can create to-dos. And I can create something fishy like eat pie with a nerdy pie sign. Put it somewhere in 1970 and give it a high priority because I'm hungry by now, almost lunchtime. So let's create that. And what we see is that in the to-do list, we see that the pie sign is translated to the ASCII representation. And obviously, we're using native to ASCII, which is a function available natively in the JDK. It's there in the bin folder. What I can do as well, I can upload files. Keep all this in mind, because we combine things now. 
and we can upload zip files. And if I upload a zip file, it unzips the file and puts the stuff in my public folder. But what if my zip file looks something like this? Um, this one. So we have two files. One file is just a normal file, a good.txt. Nothing wrong with it. But the second file, and yes, this is possible in a zip file, is a file with a file name dot dot slash 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 all the way to the root. Then slash app slash dot JDK, which I just found out on Heroku is where my JDK is located. Slash bin slash native to ASCII. So with unzipping this, if this, I'm using a library to do this, hopefully the library doesn't look at the canonical path, with I show, which I showed you in the beginning, and overwrites the native to ASCII function on the JDK on my Heroku pod. Let's try. So going back to this, choose the file. It's to-do list, exploits, zip slip.zip, this one. And let's upload it. And what we see is that in the public folder now, the good.txt is there. So unzipping took place. What happened to the other folder, to, for the, for the, to the other one? Well, let's see. Let's put in, hello, JBCM people. Give it an arbitrary date in 9070. Give it an arbitrary priority. And everything is now translated to muhahaha gotcha. Because the native to ASCII function, I overwrote it with echo muhaha gotcha. Everything that I do there will get through that function, will get overwritten. And whatever was happening in the JDK is not happening anymore with that function. Just because I used a library that was outdated, that didn't look at the canonical path, and I should have updated that. All right. So we're now aware that we need to update things. So what is the situation? Like, like, like how, can we, how can we solve these kind of things? Well, we need to think about culture, process, and tooling. So let's think about culture first. What does that mean? We work with different kinds of people. We work with developers, and we try to build things. We try to make things featureful. We try to ship it as soon as possible, uh, hopefully with a great new framework, because everybody loves new frameworks. However, this doesn't always align with what other people think. Think about the security team has, has one KPI, making sure you're not, we're not getting breached. Well. If I'm going fast and they don't have time to, to do that, and I'm just cowboying around, they will ho either hold me back or get mad at me in the end. And think about it from the other, other way around. If your program manager is pushing you to get out features, we know that we are piling up technical debt, right? The same happens what we do with, the, with, with security folks. If we're just doing it around, like, hey, it works, ship it. So we need to play along. And we need to be aware that security is also partially our responsibility as developers. Then we need to think about process. Like, how do we do this? Don't try to create new process because nobody cares. Nobody wants to do this because in the end, velocity is far more important. Look at how you do things now. And how can we integrate things like automation, tooling, but also some knowledge and actually keep it as close to what we're doing now as possible? Because then adoption to security is quite easy. It doesn't need to be disruptive. For instance, I am not in favor of actually cutting down if, uh, 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 if we have a vulnerable library in our CI pi and, and the CI pipeline says, no, you cannot deploy. I can find out a million times why I should deploy, for instance, in an emergency situation. So, and I would be the first engineer who looks how to get around of things and actually get all the tests green without being at green. Who cares? If I can deploy, I make my KPIs. But make sure that these processes are not disruptive, but actually helping you instead of working against you. And then there's tooling. Don't just pick tooling because I say you have to pick tooling. Pick the tooling that fits the process. For instance, if you work with a CI pipeline, Let's see if there is a tool that can fit in that CI pipeline seamlessly. But also, I want to do this on my local machine. And I'm using, for instance, IntelliJ. Maybe there is a plugin available that can do that. So and the, somebody else might use the CLI, or, or, or the, is more, more a terminal person. Look at tooling that helps, that works with you. Uh, 
um, maybe integrated in your build system like Maven or Gradle. Whenever you build, you test for, for these kind of things. But don't just pick tools blindly and don't leave that up to the CISOs and the security people. Make sure, as, as you think of it, that you influ try to influence that. And of course, I work for a tooling company. So close your eyes. This is the marketing part. We have sneak code, sneak open source, sneak container, and sneak infrastructure as code. Done. <laughs> now this means from all these things, kind of things, we can help you with that. But of course, there are more, more tools on the market. And feel free to use any of them as long as you do that as part of your security mindset. And do that in every part of your security life cycle, or of, of your uh, uh, life cycle, not only in your pipeline. Because if I do it in my pipeline, I probably have to wait for my old-fashioned monolith for six hours because it takes so long to build. And then the security test takes another four hours. And then I know that that one library I should upgrade from 112 to 113. That is not great. Maybe I can, well, first of all, you should look at your architecture and might like decouple a few things. But I want to do this on my local machine, like before I actually commit this to my main branch. When it lives on my main branch, it lives for there for several days, weeks, maybe even months. Why not scan that on a regular basis and get automatic pull requests with updates to newer versions of that library? Your CI pipeline is still a good thing to test it, but it's not the only part. And ask for yourself if you want to block it or not. That's up to you and your context. I cannot demand you to, and I don't want to. Depends on how you work and if it's outward facing or not. And then lastly, if you go to production, don't just say, like, hey, it's good, go to production and go turn your back on it, because that's what happened to Equifax. Make sure that you scan that. Make, use the monitoring function. Do a sneak monitor, for instance, and then we look at, for instance, your, your, your um, dependency tree, because that is static at that point when you went to production. We look at the, the Docker image that you created. That is static at that point. And if I test it over and over again, and somebody found out that in 2023, some, some silly dude implemented a LDAP lookup in a log4j, and that faced the service, then you get automatically pinged or chimed in that we need to face that. And then you can decide if you want to fix that or not. That's up to you. Again, I cannot demand you to. That's up to your, uh, you and your context. But make sure that you do that in every stage of your build and not just, oh, I implemented in the pipeline, don't have to care about that. Right? Just like your unit tests, for instance. Because who writes unit tests? Everybody. Ah, oh, thank you. Anyway, a lot of security folks say, you really need to shift left. And what we, need, what we mean with shifting left is in this thing. Start on the local machine of the developer. But face it, software is not waterfall anymore. There is no left in a continuous process which means we have to do it in all phases we, because we want to catch vulnerabilities early and often. So use the right tooling for it, but start with the right mindset. If everybody is like, no, nah, I'm a developer, I don't care about that, then you're already doomed. So hopefully you are already here. You are a bit security-minded at the very least. I applaud you and thank you for being here. <laughs>